visionary prayer. People who are visionaries pray in specific ways, and God hears their prayer. How many believe that God hears your prayer? Amen? This morning we'll be in the book of Nehemiah, chapter 1. If you'll prepare your Bible for that, verses 5 through 11. I'm reading, I'll be reading from the New Living Translation. They read a little bit differently from yours, uh, but that's the version that I feel that uh, I was supposed to read from this morning. Nehemiah chapter 1, verse 5 through 11. Then I said, O Lord God of heaven, the great and awesome God who keeps his covenant of unfailing love with those who love him and obey his commands, listen to my prayer. In three different places, in a little bit different ways, this scripture is asking and requesting of God to listen to his prayer. How many believe, we said it before, but do you believe that God hears your prayer? Yes. It says, listen to my prayer. Look down and see me praying night and day for your people, Israel. I confess that we have sinned against you. Yes, even my own family and I have sinned. We have sinned terribly by not obeying the commands, decrees, and regulations that you gave us through your servant, Moses. Please remember what you told your servant Moses. If you are unfaithful to me, I will scatter you among the nations. But if you return to me and obey my commands and live by them, then if you are exiled to the ends of the earth, I will bring you back to the place I have chosen for my name to be honored. If you are disobedient, you will be scattered. If you are obedient, you will be gathered. We need to hear that this morning. Verse 10, the people be rescued by your great power and strong hand are your servants. Oh Lord, please hear my prayer. Listen to the prayers of those of us who delight in honoring you. Please grant me success today by making the king favorable to me. Say the word favor. favor. Put it in his heart to be kind to me. In those days, I was the king's cupbearer. May God add a blessing to the reading of his word. You may be seated this morning. So a few weeks ago, we began a series of messages uh, prior to Christmas. We had three weeks of Christmas messages. But we began a series of messages called Catching the Vision. And today I want to kind of continue along that path. And as we look at vision and vision casting, that's what many people call what I'm doing now, is casting a vision. But if a vision is cast to you, what's required of you? You're supposed to catch it, right? So we are catching uh, the vision. And as we look at vision and vision casting, we are in the book of Nehemiah, uh, and we've already read the first five verses, and we come to understand that Israel is in trouble. They are in a desperate situation. They have been destroyed by the Babylonians, but God has been faithful, and over a number of years, the temple has been rebuilt. Now, what happens in the temple? Prayer and reading of the Word of God. And so that is our focus as we begin the new year to be in prayer and to be a people of the Word. That's what God has called us to do. And we see that the temple has been rebuilt, the city has been rebuilt, but yet the walls are still in rubble and they, the gates have been burned. Now, I, I have been to Jerusalem. I've been blessed to be there. And it is a city that is surrounded by walls. Cannot imagine all of those walls being so torn apart and all of the gates 
uh, being destroyed by fire. It's unimaginable uh, to me that God would use Nehemiah and the remnant of people that were left there and that came there to rebuild those walls and to put those gates back into place in just 52 days. You see, that's the power of vision and catching and casting a vision. How many believe that God is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we could ask or imagine, especially if we come together in unity? Amen? Amen. And so God has called us to do a work uh, in this day and in uh, this time. And when Nehemiah heard about the situation, what did he do? It says he sat down, he wept, he mourned, he fasted, and he prayed. Why? Because he was concerned not only about the situation. The situation was the, the walls being down. The situation was the gates being burned by fire. But he was concerned about the people. You see, you understand when you have a vision from God that it is always about people. That Jesus came to seek and to save the lost. That God would that all would come to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. And so when you have a concern for people, you have captured, you have caught the heart of God. And so whenever God begins to do things, he uses our concern for people to lay a burden upon our hearts. Uh, again, I speak uh, a mind that is clear to hear. Amen? Are, are, are you, has the fog been lifted this morning? As Nehemiah began to fast and to pray, and what we don't understand unless you do your homework, is begin to realize that he has been fasting and praying for four months. Now I'm sure during this time that there were some periods when he ate, but it was his heart to seek after God and what God would do. And you know, when you begin to pray that long, you begin to see that God has laid a vision and a burden upon your heart for you to do something about it. Can I get an amen this morning? And so we see that uh, Nehemiah has this burden for people. He has this burden and he has begun to pray. Now every year about this time, and we will begin to fast and to pray for 21 days as a church, corporately. And if you can join that, I encourage you to do so. And you don't have to fast the whole 21 days of uh, all meals, but fast a meal or fast... Uh, something I would encourage you for sure if you can lay down that social media like Facebook and all those kinds of things and begin to take that time and begin to just concentrate upon God and begin to pray then I promise you that you will be strengthened during this time so fast some meals if you can fast certain things every year I fast caffeine but Nehemiah had prayed and fasted for four months. It was his passion for people that drove him to action. And that's what God uses within us. And the amazing thing about Nehemiah is that he was really just an ordinary guy, but God had ordained beforehand that he would do extraordinary things through him. And I declare over you today that we are ordinary people, but God has destined us to do extraordinary things with his power, with his Holy Spirit. How many receive that today? Yes. See, in order for the vision that God has laid upon you to come to pass, he has to be involved. He has to be a part of it. And when we look at Nehemiah, the first thing he did was pray. Now, I'm rehearsing a little bit of this. You may remember it. Because I told you to look at your neighbor and say, pray first. Look at him and say it. Say it again. Remind them. you gotta, you got to pray first. Because praying is not our first inclination as a human. Our first inclination is sometimes fear, sometimes worry, sometimes stress. 
sometimes to call the doctor instead of calling God, sometimes to call the lawyer instead of getting a hold of God. Uh, you see, we need to pray first and to get a hold of heaven and to hear what God wants us to hear and to do in the time that we live in, in the day, because we are like uh, Esther. We are called for such a time as this, and we need to hear God's voice. And to hear it clearly. How do I want to hear, hear from the Lord? I, I seek after the Lord not just in those 21 days, but there are specific set-aside time that I'm seeking God's Word and His will for us corporately and for me, for my life and for my family. And as Nehemiah begins to pray, the very first thing that he did was he began to glorify God. We talked a little bit about that in but I, I want us to understand that as we begin to magnify God and begin to lift him up and begin to see how holy he is and how powerful he is and, and how he can defeat the enemy in our life and he can change situations and he can do beyond what we can imagine. As we begin to lift up a holy God, something begins to happen within our heart and our life. And we begin to see the problems come down and God be lifted high and be exalted and be enthroned upon the praises of the people. But the other thing that happens is that we begin to see how unholy we are yes. in comparison to God. And Nehemiah saw that. We read about it. And he began to repent. A part of visionary prayer is repentance. Now, I know as Christians, we don't like to hear about Christians needing to repent. But here is a man who accomplished what we could not imagine in 52 days with the help of God and the help of God's people. And he began to repent, first of all, for his nation. And I prayed that this morning. God, forgive us as a nation. For we have gone far away from your plan for us as a nation. We were called to be a nation that sent the word of God, and we still do. And that, that was the missionary satellite for the world, and we still are, but we're far from where we ought to be. God, forgive us for not standing up for the innocent, the children that we have aborted, for all of these things that we have allowed as a nation. I'm serious, folks. We, we as... As Christians, we are we stand in the gap for our nation and for our world. And we need to pray for our president. And we need to pray for our uh, senators. And we need to pray for our uh, legislature and all that. We need to pray for God to intervene on behalf of our nation. And then we see that he began to pray for his family. See where this is going? For the nation to his family. For he said, For well, we have sinned and become short. We've not done, God, we have drastically sinned against your decrees and your word. But then he goes even further because the spotlight of God and his God and his word will begin to fall upon you individually. And whenever it does, it begins to change your heart and you begin to see who you are in relation to him. And we, as God's people, must repent because God uses clean hands and a pure heart. His word says that we can approach his holy hill, his Mount Zion, with only clean hands and a pure heart. And as we approach God, we approach him through prayer. James 5.16 says that the effectual, fervent prayer of a man availeth much. Is that what it says? But what kind of man? A righteous man. You see, God hears when we have repented and we stand before him righteous, not in our own righteousness, but in the righteousness of Christ Jesus. And therefore we are a clean vessel and God can do a mighty work through us. 
uh, he is able to do greater than what we can imagine. The effectual, it is effective. It happens. It makes something begin to move in the spirit realm when God's righteous people begin to pray. Now, I've never been accused of not being fervent or passionate when I preach. I might be boring. I might have missed it. I might have done some other things, but I'm excited about it, even though it might not be that great. <laughs> because we need to put our passion behind prayer. It's effective, it's passionate, and it avails or it does much. It works. Look at your neighbor and say, prayer works. Prayer works. Despite what the enemy might tell you, Prayer works. Prayer works. Prayer breaks through what the enemy has planned. Can I just preach this morning? Uh, my notes are way back there. Prayer breaks through what the enemy has planned and deceived you to believe. And it accomplishes much in the kingdom of God. And if we were a people of prayer more, then we would see God moving more in the midst of his people. All of us can stand to pray a little more. Can I get an amen? amen? And so, pray first. Pray first. A few weeks ago, I declared what I believe God's vision was for this church. You can hear that, see that. We have all of the Facebooks and the podcasts that you could imagine. And I encourage you, go back, because it's been a few weeks. Listen to what God has declared. Because as a church, we must keep the vision in front of us. And a church with a vision makes provision for the future. Yes, amen. It believes that unless God comes back, that we need to be... I wish I had a baby in here this morning. Just, we need to put the, the children upon our shoulders and begin to, to have them to, to feel the presence of God and to uh, understand how God moves and works. And we are a church of legacy. Yes, amen. We are a church of legacy. So we must make provision for the future. We've had a great heritage, but the best is yet to come. We have had a great heritage, but the best is yet to come. I received that, amen? amen? God is doing the work. So if we look at Nehemiah, and his first response was to pray. He heard about the condition of Israel, and he knew that there was nothing that he could physically do. How many knows there are things in this life that we cannot do a thing about physically, but what would happen is if we got such a concern that we begin to pray and we begin to ask God to tear down strongholds and God to move in ways that only he could move. And we just begin to declare life over people and we begin to believe that God would save and God would fill with the Holy Spirit. Yes, he still does that. And that God would heal bodies and that God would uh, help the broken and that he would mend the hearts of people if we would just pray. Look at your neighbor and say, start with prayer. Here's Nehemiah, a regular guy, but yet a visionary. And I can imagine, because I've done that before, him saying, God, I'm a regular guy. And I feel like I'm working in the wrong place at the wrong time. But he began to pray. And he began to believe God. And they begin to rehearse God's promises. This is key. It's what visionary people do. God, your word says X. I'm going to believe X until I receive X. Amen. I believe it. You said it. You have to back this. You said it. I believe it. It's going to happen. It's going to happen even if you don't believe it. You see, visionary people Remember God's promises. And here's Nehemiah, and he remembered not only the good promise of God, but the bad promise. He remembers that God said, if you walk away from me, if you turn your back from me, then I will scatter you. And I believe uh, that we have experienced 
some scattering in the church of God throughout the last couple of years. But I am just going to prophetically say that this will be the year of gathering as we begin to return back to God and become obedient to His Word. And I want gathering and not scattering. God likes to be reminded of His promises. It's not that he's forgotten, but it's that we have understood his word and relied upon it and believed it. And when we know God's promises and his will, then we're able to pray confidently and effectively. But look at Nehemiah's prayer. God grant me success. God give me favor with the king. What's he doing? He said, here's the problem. God, I need some specific answers to prayer and how you want me to get involved. How many of you prayed your 10 or 15 minute prayer in the morning and then you get in the car and you, and you go, what did I even pray about? Sometimes our prayers become repetitive in nature and we don't understand and we have not requested specific things of God. God, give me some open doors today. Can I just help you out? God, open up some doors and God, give me faith to walk through them and, and God, uh, put people in my path that I can uh, just express your love and your uh, devotion to them and that I can witness to them. God, uh, uh, meet my need. There's a specific thing that I need today from you, God. Would you do that, Lord? It's like a conversation with the Lord. The first thing we ought to do is lift him up Praise him and begin to rehearse his promises. When you pray God's promises, he hears. Because he says his word will not return unto him void, but it will accomplish the purpose that he has sent it to do. Amen. His word is powerful. So Nehemiah has been praying and fasting for four months. But God moved. And God touched the heart of a wicked king to give help. That's the favor of God. And, and we, men and women, if your husband is not saved, need to ask God as the spiritual leaders of our household to grant us his favor. Not only with him, we need God's favor, but we need God's favor with the king. We need God's favor with the governor. We need God's favor with the city council. We need God's, come on, help me out, because we've experienced that. We need God's favor with the banks. We need God's favor with uh, the lawyers. We need God's favor in order to accomplish the purpose because it is so great that God has declared over us. We need God's favor. So Nehemiah prayed for an opportunity to make a difference. He didn't sit back and say, let's see how you're going to do this one, God. He didn't do that. What did he do? God, give me a plan. And he had one, and we're not going to go into that today. But when the king approached him and said, what can I do to help? He already had a plan because God had begun to pour it into his heart like specific needs and things that he, uh, uh, if he had them, he could accomplish the purpose. This morning, I'm encouraging you to pray like a visionary person because God is working behind the scenes to accomplish the vision that is given to your life. And as we look at the vision, as we look at these statements that I gave you to put on your mirror, to put on your refrigerator. As we look at them, that's what God wants to do in us. But we always know what God wants to do before we know how He wants to do it. I, I have a vision of where God wants us to be. But I don't know how yet in some areas. And that's all right. Because as we seek God, he, he does not really hide 
The problem is our proximity to Him and to His voice. It's a proximity principle. Are we close enough to hear His voice? And that's what I'm asking you. Beginning on January the 11th for about 21 days to draw close and near to God. To hear His voice. How many want to hear His voice this morning? To hear His voice. Many times when God gives you a vision, it is so great and seems so impossible to you that we set it to the side. Anybody besides me ever done that? And we begin to look at it and we don't speak life into it. And God wants to do great things through us that we cannot even imagine is what his word says to us. And as I first became your pastor, can I tell you, I was a little worried and a little concerned. I mean, I've done a little bit of preaching. I've taught Sunday school. I've led worship for a couple of decades, but to pastor a church. But it goes back to vision, and God began to drop little nuggets of vision. First of all, the word legacy. But before he did any of that, guess what he did? He gave me a love for people. That's what he did. A love for you. Sometimes we are not so lovable. And so God begins to give a love for people. And God, I, I knew that God wanted to do something and it had been declared over this church. But then God began to pour a love out for his people into my heart and into my life. And I, I used to laugh at Jim Smith when he said, I love you, I make nothing you can do about it. But I understand that sentiment. I understand. Because God begins to give you binoculars to see into people's lives and what God has called them to do and how that he begins to work all of that. And as Kelly is obedient to the vision in her life, as Aaron Beth is obedient to God and the purpose in her life, as Maybelline and Brenda and Linda and Junior, and if all of us begin to do what God's called us to do, then something mighty and miraculous begins to take place and God begins to mesh it and to pull it together into something that we could not have ever imagined corporately. And guess what? God sent some new people in as well. God sent some new people in as well to incorporate into his vision for this house and for his purpose. Do not discount yourself. You are a valuable piece of God's puzzle. I speak God's favor upon you. I speak his vision into your heart and life. And that nudge that you feel to do something for God, it's not just a daydream. It is a God-given vision that he has cast upon your life that works together with